pleasure to be speaking to my uh, friends in, in, in the UK. Um, it seems quite a while since I've been there. This, uh, uh, I think I was giving a lecture series at Warwick in the, the height of winter. Hopefully I can come next time in the summer, um, but it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I want to talk to you about um, the BOF, and I want to challenge a few ideas that you may hear about what the future of steelmaking is and get you to think. And I quite purposely um, are a little, you know, being a little bit controversial um, because I want to get people thinking about some of the issues. So let, let's go through what I'm we're getting at. Um, right. So first of all, the big picture, uh, which has already been um, painted quite well from our previous speakers, but just so we're all on the same page, um, the steelmaking industry contributes about 8% of the CO2 in the world, roughly. And it is a very big issue to, to countries like the UK, but particularly to Australia, because we sell a lot of iron ore and a lot of coal to that industry. So it has a very big repercussions to Australia. And we all know there's a big move to decarburization, but there's also a move to the circular economy. And they're not exactly the same thing. There are different issues there. And one of the big issues is how do we link renewables to heavy industry? And that's an issue not just for steel, that's for many industries. And people are advocating strongly that hydrogen can fill that gap. So we can use hydrogen from a green source, a renewable source, and this will link renewables to heavy to the steel industry. And then there's another line of argument, which is saying, well, couldn't we just rely on the re recycled steel, all right? Now, there are some serious impediments to that, and it has some repercussions to our existing technology, which I want to explain to you. Um, this is the famous uh, overall flow sheet for steel making. I think most people in the room are familiar with it. But what I want to highlight is today, instead of talking about the blast furnace and the DRI, and I see that there's some very nice speakers coming along in the next day or so, we're going to speak about that. I really want to concentrate a bit on the steel making part, the electric furnace and the BIF. And something that's a little bit different about my background to many people is I've worked on, I've worked on both the blast furnace, and I have worked on DRI, and I have worked on EAF, and I have worked on BOS. So I'm a bit agnostic in that way. And um, and there's some issues about using EAFs that need to be uh, spoken about, and some of the issues with the BOF. Um, one of the things that's been said at the moment is what we need to do is bring hydrogen into this DRI part here and convert it to the electric furnace, and our problems will be over with decarburizing the steel industry. That sort of view is put. I must say, people who know a lot about steel making realize it's much more complicated than that, but that is a, a thing that you do read. There's a lot of issues with that. And what I'm going to be really saying is, let's have a look at this thing here, the BOS, which makes 70% of the world steel at the moment. And what can we do with it to make it a successful reactor for the changing environment uh, of uh, the steel industry that's trying to decarburize? Um, and you all know that there's a lot of investment in hydrogen uh, iron making in Europe. And here's two pretty well-known efforts. The, uh, the Germans are, are putting uh, uh, hydrogen into their blast furnace and uh, actually sharing a lot of information, actually. They're, they're very good. They, they sent information to me, which I'm very grateful of. And of course, there's also hybrid, which is combining hydrogen DRI making, a shaft process for making DRI, and then linking it to an electric furnace. It's very hard to find much technical information about that, but you can find lots of publicity. But um, let's talk through some of the issues. Now, when you read the people who are advocating that the electric furnace is the answer, they look at graphs like this and they say things like, oh, look at all the CO2 associated with the blast furnace and the BOF, and look at this wonderful uh, electric arc furnace area where when we go to hydrogen, it all goes down close to zero. This analysis is, 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 I think, misleading. It's too strong a word, but very simplistic. And what I'm going to be showing to you is, in fact, there is a lot that can be done to bring these curves down for the uh, BOF route. And there are big issues with these curves here about particularly if we start making a lot of DRI. So these curves are quite movable, and there are aspects of them that are important to appreciate that I want to get across to you. So the first thing you need to know is that the feed material for the DRI and the blast furnace is iron ore, and Australia sells a lot of it. And 
the quality of iron ore is generally speaking deteriorating around the world. And here's a nice graph done some from by researchers at RMIT and Monash University showing the general decline of iron ore grade. And as the iron ore grade degrades around the world, that means we have more and more gang materials to deal with in the iron making and then the steel making process, particularly in the iron making process. And this is not a trivial issue as you're about to see. At the moment, when you sell uh, iron ore to make DRI, you generally sell the really rich stuff. So if we go back here, we're selling up here 67, 66%, right? But if DRI becomes a major process, we'll be selling a lot more of those leaner ores into DRI processing. Now, even with the rich iron ore going into DRI, you can see here that as you push the DRI input into an electric furnace, you get a very large increase in emissions. And I can also tell you from experience of having done it, you also get much lower productivity, much lower. So what's happening is as you push DRI, this curve goes up and you will notice that the curve gets quite close to the, the blast furnace and the BOF. It's moving upwards as we go up this curve because of all the gang. This line will slope further up if we start increasing the amount of DRI in the world because we won't be able to use the lean ores. We'll have to use the rich, uh, sorry, the rich ores. We'll have to use the lean ores. So this curve, this curve here showing the energy and the CO2 emitted from this will go this way as we, um, as we enlarge DRI, DRI production. So it's not as clear cut anymore that it is an advantage over the, doing something with the blast furnace and the BOF. And we'll talk more about this as well. Now something to realize about the EAF is that the EAF currently, current EAF technology is largely a combination of electrical and chemical energy. A typical EAF would have maybe, depending on the details, you know, 30, 40, 50% chemical energy coming into the flow sheet. It's actually quite a lot of a chemical reactor as well as an electrical reactor. And what's also interesting about it is the typical EAF has heat losses around 30 to 40%. I repeat that, 30 to 40%. So in a world that is trying to restrain from wasting energy, there are some problems with the EAF in terms of a place where you would be melting a lot of materials which has high gain. So I'm hoping straight away you're seeing this idea that the EAF is some great answer to this issue. Uh, it's very simplistic. And there are a lot of issues about putting a lot of DRI into an EAF. Um, there's also the other side, which is the scrap. The scrap is, um, is in, you know, the scrap is growing in the world, the scrap supply, particularly with China, but it's also growing with a lot of obsolete and prompt scrap. And when you look at the compositions, or as this graph shows here, and when you look at the compositions of these uh, obsolete and prompt scraps, they have quite a lot of residuals and impurities in them. And these impurities mean that it's difficult, not impossible, but difficult to make a high grade steel. So the people that argue, oh, we'll just recycle everything, that's a bit too simple. There are some complex issues there. I'm not saying they're unsolvable, but there are complex issues there. So it's not as clear cut that we'll just go to DRI and electric furnaces because the ore quality is heading down. And it's not as obvious that we can also live off the scrap because the scrap has lots of issues in terms of residuals. These are complex problems. So then I, that slide sums it up. Basically, ores are drifting downwards in terms of quality. If we expand DRI production as advocated by many people, many of them have never visited a steel plant, I would say. If we do that, we will create a lot of issues with the EAF and a lot of productivity issues and energy issues. And the, there is obstacles to scrap uh, being the answer because of uh, residuals and general quality. And, and as already been mentioned and will be talked about more at this event, green hydrogen is itself a problem in terms of cost, and also scale. So what about if we think of rethink the BOF? The BOF is a chemically based reactor. It relies on chemical energy. 
So what, what can it do in this new world of trying to restrain carbon? Currently, people are saying, in simplistically, let's replace it with the EAF. The great advantage of the EAF is that it has, uh, it has a much more versatile technology in terms of how much scrap and metal it can handle. But it has much lower productivity, as I've already mentioned. I think what's, what we're heading towards is not throwing away the BOF. I think we're heading towards developing the BOF to deal with a wider range of feed materials. I think the future of the BOF will be in, in treating a more versatile range of feed materials, including the pig iron, including low carbon DRI from hydrogen, and perhaps including liquid uh, iron from a direct iron process, and of course, scrap. And then can we do that? Can we make it more versatile with at the same time maintaining quality and the productivity that we associate with the BOF? Maybe a new BOF technology will evolve. I know that there are young PhD students in the room. You could revolutionize the industry, believe me. There, are, there is space for a revolution here. So I would like people to think about rethinking the BOF as a versatile scrap melter. And actually, I've been doing quite a lot of studies recently, or to be honest, my PhD student, Namal, has been doing a lot of studies <laughs> recently. And Namal has been doing calculations and comparing it to good plant data. And he's showing that as you push scrap up into a BOF, the heat losses go down from around that six, seven percent down to two percent. Please note the heat losses in a BOF are less than 10 percent compared to an EAF, which is typically 30 to 40 percent. That's a very big number to think about, um, not mentioned very often when people are pushing the EAF. Um, we can also push the post-combustion up. This is the burning of the CO. Now, there's challenges in doing that. But if we push the, the CO up, we can see the amount of scrap that we can process increasing quite dramatically. Now, I've done a, this graph here. It was put together by Namal, and it really sums up a lot of what I'm saying. What we see here is we see the amount of scrap you can put in into a furnace and we see how much CO2 is produced. So that's the red line. The dotted line is the scrap line as we push up post combustion. This is current industrial operation. So if we go to the BOFs in Britain, you'll probably find that the post combustion is maybe 12, 14 no? percent. And as a result, they can't get much more than 20 the 25% scrap into the furnace. But if they could optimize that energy and burn more energy and utilize that energy, they could go up this curve and put more and more scrap and lower the overall uh, CO2. And they could also save the necessity of having to build a hydrogen plant and a, and a DRI plant. If we push up this curve, we can, um, get the BOF being more versatile and also uh, save us a lot of trouble. Um, there's also issues about the flow heat, which I think I'm running out of time to explain, but I have been studying the flow of heat in the BOF and there are arguments for being able to uh, bring in scrap more continuously instead of one batch so that we can utilize the excess heat better, match the heat with the melting. And that's probably a bit beyond the scope of today's talk. So basically I'm saying in a carbon restrained world, we should be looking at pushing the post combustion up in a BOF. We should be looking at perhaps preheating the scrap. We should be thinking about controlling the scrap size so it melts more readily. And we, we should try to push more scrap into the BOF. And that's a simple way of lowering the carbon footprint of our process. Um, there are issues, of course, around residuals that I've already discussed and refractory and control. But I do believe they're solvable. And I honestly believe they're simpler than the issues of trying to melt a very large amount of DRI in the, in the AF. And we're not the first people to be down this path. Some of you would be aware that the Brazilians have been developing what they call an EOF for well, 30, 40 years. And there's five plants operating. And what they've got there is basically a sort of slow BOF, not as, not as intensely stirred, and they try to utilize the post-combustion for preheating the scrap. And they get scrap ratios up towards 40% into their, by doing this, all right? So there's already people doing a version of this already. 
Now, this is specifically for the British steel industry, for my friends. <laughs> um, you, before you start looking at the cost of bringing in hydrogen DRI and introducing new AFs, why don't you investigate pushing the small scrap into, into your BOF by increasing post-combustion, looking at maybe semi-continuous feed to optimize the heat, look at perhaps scrap reheating if you, can, you need to go further, and just becoming cleverer at sizing and sorting the scrap. I believe if you did this, you would significantly lower the footprint of your industry without having to make some very high risk investments in hydrogen, hydrogen technology. And I want to be quite clear here, I'm not against hydrogen ion making, quite the opposite. But I think we should try to optimize some of our assets by being cleverer. Thank you for listening to my talk.